So uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony Faramelli, uh, psychosocial researcher and practitioner. He is a lecturer in uh, visual cultures at Goldsmiths, uh, University of London, where he uh, co-leads uh, the BA in Fine Art and History of Art. Uh, Anthony also works as a uh, mental health recovery program consultant and uh, reflective practice facilitator. Uh, he is a member of the executive uh, board uh, of the Association for Psychosocial Studies and is a founding member of the Network for Institutional Analysis. Uh, he is the author uh, of uh, Resistance, Revolution and Fascism, Zapatismo and Assemblage Politics, published uh, by Bloomsbury 2018, and an editor with David uh, Hancock and Rob White of Spaces of Crisis, and critique Heterotopias Beyond Foucault, again Bloomsbury 2018. Currently he is completing a monograph provisionally titled The Mass Psychology of Fascism in the Age of Machines, Big Data, Surveillance and Control. And today he will be talking uh, about institutional cartographies, analyzing the social after Gattari and CERFI. <laughs> so the stage is yours. The quick picture. A děkuji vám za pozvání, abych zde dnes um, pro mluvil. Um, I'll stop butchering your language now. It's been a while since I've last spoken Czech. Um, before I get started, I, I do want to thank you for, for this invitation um, to be here. It's really rare to be at a colloquium where you immediately connect with every presentation. Uh, and, and you see the kind of immediate kind of refrains running through everything um, in, in such a kind of seamless way. So thank you for that, and thank you for organizing this. So to begin, um, it's probably good to situate myself in this paper in relation to the, the kind of larger questions raised here. Um, and I want to foreshadow the fact that I'm a practitioner. Um, so as much as this presentation and my work in general is informed by my research on Guattari, Fanon, and institutional analysis, it's more than anything grounded in my experiences working in frontline services. Um, that's frontline services in mental health, uh, refugee, and homeless um, services. I think it's really important to flag this up um, because it directly informs my argument as to how we should read Guattari. Um, and I'm quite explicitly pulling out Guattari from the kind of Deleuze Guattari assemblage here to think about the way in which um, his day-to-day -day practice informed um, the, the collaboration with Deleuze as, as well as was generative of a certain kind of politics of, of care. Um, Guattari's writing is infamously obtuse to the point of even being somewhat occult. Um, this has unfortunately led many to read his work as being abstracted from, if not totally detached from, grounded real-world experience. However, Guattari would always was based, um, Guattari's thought always flowed out of his clinical work at the board and from his involvement in different political and social movements. As such, his thought is fundamentally theory and practice. And this is something that I really want to insist on, that there's no way to understand Guattari's work without contextualizing it in and understanding it as a form of practice. The other aspect of Guattari's work that is, is that it's always collective. Beyond his collaborations with Deleuze, Guattari was always thinking and working with others. Indeed, um, anecdotally, when he first started working with Deleuze, he found it kind of odd to only be collaborating with one other person. Um, and this is why I also want to insist that we cannot read Guattari alone. As a member of the institutional psychotherapy movement, as well as a core and founding member of the Serfi, his thought cannot fully be separated from that of Tosquez, Woody, Fanon, Kidian, and others. In other words, to read Guattari's work is always to read a multiplicity of voices, hence his insistence to often write and speak as we rather than I even in his solo authored texts and presentations. When taken together, we can see how Guattari's practice is one that was always collaborative instances of theory and practice with the aim of opening up forms of institutional creativity. Um, and this idea of institutional creativity is something I'm gonna to return to a little bit later on. Um, 
The other reason I want to situate my talk like this um, is because of how we can use institutional analysis to address the practical issues that we're collectively facing at this moment. Um, the vast majority of my work um, is on fairly dark subject matters. You know, um, for whatever masochistic reason, I'm writing my second book on fascism. Um, the research requires me to spend a lot of time on fairly dark message boards, um, which I really don't recommend anyone else going to, not if you want a good night's sleep, ever. Um, and this is why, though, I think it's so important to augment this with an engagement with this kind of theoretically informed practice. Um, because what I think we really get from this collective work is a creative, psychosocial, and anti-fascist resistance. Um, and, and this is something, again, that, that I think really informs this current moment, is how do we think of a grounded resistance that works at both the kind of material world as well as the psychological. Um, you know, so it's always this kind of dual focus, if you like, um, where one always impacts the other. So for the rest of my time here, um, I want to discuss the practice of institutional analysis. So I'm guessing there's probably not a lot of familiarity here with what it is. So I'll begin by going kind of quickly through its history. Um, and then I want to kind of pull out a couple of the concepts, specifically how they use and understand the word institution. Um, and to think about how this was constructive of a kind of form of militant research. Um, and again, this notion of militancy is something that's really important that I'll come back to later on. So to get to the history, institutional analysis is intimately tied to two other closely related movements in post-war fronts, institutional pedagogy and even more significantly, um, institutional psychotherapy. In fact, institutional psychotherapy and institutional analysis are often used interchangeably. And this isn't entirely accurate to conflate them like this, but nevertheless, it's impossible to fully disentangle them either, especially given the centrality of Guattari to both movements. The origin can be traced, roughly, if you're going to kind of historicize it, to 1939 in France at saint Alban Hospital and the work of Paul Blavet, Francois Tosquez, and Lucien Bonafé. During the occupation, these doctors pioneered a form of social therapy with the aim to resist both Nazi occupation as well as the asylum system, which they like likened to a massive concentration camp. The work done at San Alban not only su succeeded in protecting its patients from the Nazi death camps, but it also became a sanctuary for the resistance. During this time, those working at San Alban formed the Société des Guevandans, which, as Jean, Jean Uri stated, was a project to, I'm quoting Jean Uri, resist and create, to resist the policy of natural selection that was killing the mentally ill, to resist the Vichy regime that was propagating it, and to resist the broader tendencies of homogenization and segregation that characterized the treatment of mentally ill, to create a therapeutic convi conviviality in the face of segregation, and with it, to create a new direction in psychiatry, a psychiatry that would be a living art of sympathy, not an alienation, but an accompaniment of the victim. Claude Clavert further elaborated on this, writing that saint Alban's resistance to Nazi occupation and confinement is actually what transformed the hospital into a therapeutic community. To quote, during the occupation, the French underwent the collective and individual experience of a great confinement. The words liberation, therefore, had a very profound resonance, and its echoes shook the very walls of the asylum. To use a heroic metaphor, the liberation of the asylum was an extension of the liberation of the country. Um, and the, the importance of saint Alban during the war just really cannot be um, overstated. You know, famously, the Vichy regime carried out um, a kind of tacit extermination of the mentally ill. Um, those who weren't sent to the concentration camps were, were starved. Um, they literally cut off all food to psychiatric hospitals. 
Officially, this resulted in the death of 40,000 psychiatric patients, although unofficially we, we know that the number must be significantly higher. Um, one hospital endured the, the war without one death, and that was San Alban. Not one patient died there. So their work was really, really significant. Um, not only that, but it was a complete sanctuary. So um, the surrealist artists who couldn't make it out of France before the war took refuge there. Uh, Tristan Sara, specifically, ran a resistance newspaper out of San Alban, and it became a staging area for resistance fighters. Um, and the way that they did this was by integrating the hospital into the life of the village. So the hospital became central, central to the entire village, and resistance then had to have kind of a double meaning. The psychiatric patients had to be liberated so that the villagers can be liberated. And it was only through this kind of collective project that they were able to keep everyone alive. Um, and I just cannot overstate how significant this was in the history of, of occupation, um, or how impactful it was on what would be Fanon's practice as well as Guattari's. So following the war, two junior doctors, Jean Uri and Franz Fanon, as well as a little bit later on, a very young student intern named Felix Guattari, all came to San Alban and worked with Tosquez to transform the social therapy they developed during the war into what was referred to as institutional psychotherapy. And also, just take a moment to, to think about this. For that one brief moment in time, you had Franz Fanon, Jean Uri, Felix Guattari, <laughs> and Francois Tosquez, Lucien Balnofet, all there at the same time working together. Um, again, just the amazing connections there cannot be overstated, you know, because of this one kind of moment in time. Um, institutional psychotherapy is not so much a coherent practice as it's a movement of politically committed mental health pro um, professionals. The constantly evolving approach that they utilize is designed as a resistance to the enclosed and alienating spaces created by the concentration camp asylum system and societies that engender this form of segregation. It constructs a heterotopic inversion of society, opening counter spaces that work to disalienate and de-depersonalize patients. And that's a quote from Tosquez. Institutional psychotherapy is fundamentally based on the idea um, that the hospital is basically a microcosm of society and the hospital is ill. Therefore, before you can treat your patients, you must first treat the hospital. Um, basically, institutional psychotherapy formed the kind of therapeutic doctoral basis of the work done at San Alban, as well as the hospitals Blida Joinsville and Charles Nicole, uh, where Fanon was based at, and of course, famously, the Board Clinic. However, Guattari became dissatisfied with confining the work just to the clinic, and in a move that very much mirrored Fanon's practice in Tunisia, he looked to expand it to the fields of sociology, urban studies, pedagogy, and human geography in order to more explicitly analyze and make interventions into the social. Working with Anne Kittian, who was at the time an intern at Labor, um, Guattari established the FERGI, uh, which is the Federation, oh God, what was it? the Federation for the Study and Research of Institutions. Um, basically, FERGI was an umbrella organization that encompassed um, the Center de Estudies de Research et Formation de Institutional, the, the Center for um, Study and Research of Institutional Formations, um, more commonly referred to as the CERFI. Um, active between 1967 and 1987, the CERFI was made up of about 20 sociologists, urbanists, economists, psychologists, pedagogues, and activists. They worked and kind of met together once a week and worked in these kind of small general assemblies and thematic working groups. And they always maintained their independence um, by always being outside of the organizations that they were working for um, as consultants. This allowed them, um, in Jean Uri's, or no, I'm sorry, um, Felix Guattari's words, to resist the tendency to become civil servants, academics, union party bureaucrats. Um, so the Surfi always tried to resist this 
process of kind of becoming part of what they were analyzing. Um, one way to kind of think about this, or at least for me it helps to keep this in my head straight, is if institutional psychotherapy and institutional pedagogy are the movements, institutional analysis could be thought of as the practice. So fundamentally, um, what institutional analysis is, is a form of collective and user-led participant research. At the most basic level, the SERFI was concerned with the analysis of what Guattari termed the collective equipment that allows for different institutional arrangements to function. So maybe it's really important here just to kind of take a step back and kind of work through some of these terms to just understand the specificity of what they meant and how they used it. Um, specifically the word institution, because it has a very different meaning in the French than it does in English. Um, basically, oftentimes in the Anglophone world, when we say the word institution, what we're talking about in the French would be an establishment. Um, whereas an institution is not the, is something more immaterial, that, that institutes forms of sociality. Um, Guattari stated, and this is a quote from... Um, I don't know why. There, there's a weird Freudian thing happening. Wherever I want to say Uri, I say Guattari. And whenever I want to say Guattari, I say Uri, which I'm sure a lot of people would have a lot to say about. <laughs> um, so in the words of Jean Uri, not Guattari, he stated, The establishment is a building and a contract agreed with the state, a, per price, a price per day. The institution, when it exists, is a labor. It's a strategy to avoid a whole load of people fermenting, like a jar of jam with a poorly closed lid. So the term institution carries with it a kind of generality and a much broader significance, since it must also refer to anything that is properly instituted by human activity. Institutions, therefore, are a containing mechanism for all forms of sociality. They're what provides consistency to social relations. Um, and, and the kind of general approach of, of Guattari in particular, and the Surfi in general, was to see um, institutions as being incredibly malleable, um, like a kind of modeling clay, which was an analogy Guattari was quite um, fond of using. You know, they could be worked and reworked in order to always open up spaces for different flows of conversation to increase the degree of transversality throughout the organization that they're working within. And as soon as it starts closing down, because institutions are so malleable, you can immediately start to rework it and kind of open it up. Um, so, so it's something that is very dynamic. And one of the things that you get oftentimes is a conflation between institutional psychotherapy um, and institutional analysis and anti-psychiatry. Specifically, anti-psychiatry as, as, you know, kind of Lang and Cooper conceptualized it, or Franco um, Basilia in, in Italy. But, but there's a really, really important difference um, between them. You know, where kind of Lang and Cooper just kind of wanted to smash the institutions and let the pieces fall where they may. Um, institutional psychotherapy, institutional analysis, sees this um, as not only a kind of wrong-headed approach, but, but fundamentally violent and harmful. Um, you need the institution there to kind of contain the individuals. Um, you just have to rework it in such a way that, that it becomes, you know, that, that it doesn't become static. Um, and, and you can kind of get this in Guattari's critique of Lang and Cooper, specifically his reading of um, Mary Barnes. You know, the way in which by trying to smash the institution, um, anti-psychiatry, in fact, reinforced a kind of oedipalized and, and sexist reading upon Mary Barnes. Um, you know, and this is why you have to work a lot slower, a lot more carefully, um, to rework the institution. You know, one can think here in Thousand Plateaus of that kind of famous maxim, it's always better to use a fine file than a sledgehammer. Um, you know, you don't want to just smash it, you need to consider the, the kind of life worlds contained within the institution. 
So all of this is basically to say that institutional analysis understands the social as constructed by heterogenic institutional machines that, to quote Guattari, give real consistency to the socius, assemblages which put into play a complex met uh, metabolism of organic perceptual functions, modes of semiotization and subjectification. So to analyze the social is then to analyze a kind of network of institutions that comprise the social, um, and specifically to look at the collective equipment that, that kind of allow the institutions to work. So collective equipment is basically anything that orders flows of desire and um, modes of sociality. But they're not general instruments, um, rather they're related to axioms. Again, to quote Guattari, therefore, far from understanding the nature of an equipment according to its spatialized form it takes, it's necessary to first understand what kind of axiomatic is implied. In this way, we're going to see the correlative modifications of the conception of an office, a thoroughfare, rooms facing the doctor's office, the conception of an entranceway, a courtyard, end quote. So although the term collective equipment speaks to material elements, it's actually better understood as a mechanism that gives consistency to all forms of social interaction. And I think a kind of good way to understand this is to look at the kitchen in a mental health service. So a kitchen is, of course, comprised of all the necessary equipment to prepare and serve food. Um, it has a counter arrangement um, for, for more efficient food prep. Um, it has a large board with meal plans and recipes, um, as well as a separate board facing out that, that has the daily um, meals on it. Um, it has a washing up station. There's a seating plan for the residents who come and collect their food and eat. And, and the seating plan is all done so it can be done in, in a kind of efficient way, right? Um, you, you, even beyond mental health services, if anyone here has ever worked in a kitchen, you know that it's structured very much for speed and efficiency. Um, and in this way, a kitchen is set up that the kind of material conditions of the kitchen, you know, the way it's organized, um, the space itself, is set up in such a way that implicitly places the chef in a privileged position. That means to say, as soon as you enter a kitchen, you are immediately entering into a hierarchical relationship. Um, assistant chefs are subordinate, as are the residents who come to collect their food. And this has a really specific impact on how individuals socialize in the kitchen, and who implicitly keeps a dominant position, and who is implicitly always subaltern. Um, so because the kitchen is arranged in such a way, it hierarchicalizes not sure if that's a word, um, the, the way in which people are ordered in the room, which automatically always already impacts how you socialize, um, which Guattari is always interested in because this in turn impacts the formation of subjectivity. Um, collective equipment can be seen as a way of reinforcing kind of different unconscious processes and power dynamics, you know, where they trap and redirect flows of desire. Um, importantly, and, and Guattari insists on this, collective equipment does not create different modes of semiotization, but it hierarchizes them. It puts them on a kind of semiotic grid that functions as a machine of subjection um, at the service of different power formations. So it takes all the kind of different semiotic elements and puts it into a hierarchy, you know, so you kind of know your place immediately. Um, so, so if this is what they're analyzing, it's, it's important to think about what they mean by analysis. Um, the, the term cartography in, in my title of my paper is quite knowing because the idea of Cartography, just like analysis, is to make an intervention. It's not to kind of passively look at or observe. Um, and institutional analysis is fundamentally militant because by, by an analyzing these different institutional arrangements, they mean to make an immediate intervention into the social field. So, so you always 
mutate that which you analyze. Um, and by mutating these different institutional arrangements, what they're hoping to do is modify the way in which institutions contain individuals. And, and when I say contain, I'm, I'm very much thinking of the kind of container contained uh, model that you get in Beyond. So if you're familiar with the work of Bion, the um, English psychoanalyst, he talks about the therapeutic arrangement as forming a containment around the people you're, you're working with, your patients, where you, as a therapist, are able to take their disturbed feelings and metabolize it and give it back to them in a way that's um, nourishing. And, and that's why I think it's so t telling that Guattari also talks about this in terms of metabolizing. Um, I, I think he was very much reading beyond when he kind of came up with this. Um, there's a lot to suggest that, at least. Um, so what they're trying to do, then, is modify the forms of containment. Um, to think about this, again, in a kind of grounded, this return to the kitchen. So Guattari um, explains how the collective equipment in a kitchen is analyzed and acted upon so as to increase the coefficient of transversality specifically speaking about the role of Laborde's kitchen and the kind of mechanism it has for the production of subjectivity, Guattari writes, um, and this is going to be a slightly long quote, I apologize. Consider, for example, the institutional sub-assemble that constitutes the kitchen at Laborde Clinic. It combines highly heterogeneous social, subjective, and functional dimensions. This territory can close in on itself, become a site of stereotyped attitudes and behavior, where everyone mechanically carries out their little refrain. They can also come to life, trigger an existential amalgamation, a drive machine. The kitchen then becomes a little opera. In it, people talk, dance, and play with all kinds of instruments, with water and fire, dough and dustbins, relations of prestige and submission. As a place for the preparation of food, it is a center of exchange of material and indicative fluxes and presentations of every kind. But this metabolism of flow will only have transferential significance on the conditions that the whole apparatus functions efficiently as a structure that welcomes the pre-verbal components of the psychotic patients. This resource, resource of ambiance, and, and ambiance is really knowingly uh, relation to um, Merleau Ponte and, and his um, philosophy of contextual subjectivity is itself indexed to the degree of openness, the coefficient of transversality of this institutional subassembly to the rest of the institution. The semiotization of a fantasy, therefore, depends on external operators. The proper functioning of the kitchen, from this point of view, is inseparable from its articulation with other partial nuclei of subjection in the institution, the menu committee, the daily activity information sheet, the pastry workshop, the greenhouse, the garden, the bar, sports activities, the meeting between cooks and doctors with respect to the patients they are working with. The psychotic who approaches an institutional subassemble, like the kitchen, therefore transverses a well-worked zone of enunciation which can sometimes be closed in on itself and subjected to roles and functions, or find itself in direct contact with universes of alterity, which help the psychotic out of his existential entrapment. It is less by way of voluntary decision than by induction of an unconscious collective assemblage that the psychotic is led to take the initiative and to accept responsibility. So here he thinks about the role the kitchen played and, and how throughout the day, by rearranging the collective equipment, you can change the function of the room. In fact, that was a kind of daily practice at the board clinic. Um, every room was kind of given a signifier, right? Um, in an almost kind of Lacanian sense. But then the idea then was how can you play with the signification of that room by adjusting the room's ambiance in order to open up or close down different modes of sociality. And the whole idea of this was to create um, what they referred to as the chance encounter for therapeutic interventions. Um, you know, speaking as someone who has worked in mental health services and other services for 20-odd for years, 
um, that that's the thing that you can't underestimate is it's these chance encounters you know um, having a cigarette with someone on the doorstep or, or the conversation you have while you make crepe you know these are the things that that really increase um, what Guattari referred to as the coefficient of transversality what he was really talking about with the coefficient of transversality in relation to institutional psychotherapy was exactly the potential for these chance therapeutic encounters and, and he's really specific on this um, it's also if you go back and read John Uri's stuff on the kitchen um, you always get that frustration of how many chefs they went through on a yearly basis, you know, because the chefs don't want to give up their hierarchical position in the kitchen um, that was required of them. So, so you know, th there are these great interviews with Jean Odi where he's just like, yeah, these fucking chefs, man. <laughs> you, know, you know, like, they, they just don't want to play ball. They just come in as these little dictators. Um, so, so it's, you know, not to say that it was kind of worked seamlessly either, but, but this was always the process and the, the you know, project. Um, the way in which Guattari frames the kitchen as an institutional sub-assemble is really telling. However, it's Anne Kittian's work that's perhaps the most instructive here. As a member of SURFI, Anne Kittian was part of multiple projects that had profound, if largely unnoticed, impact on the thought of Guattari as well as Deleuze. Um, I probably don't really have time to get into it here, but, but Kittian's work was actually really impactful for their concept of the refrain, as well as nomadology and the war machine. Um, but she's constantly kind of overlooked in the scholarship. Uh, I have some thoughts on that, but I'll, I'll save that for when the camera is not rolling. Um, and maybe after a couple beers. Watch this space. <laughs> um, most significant to this discussion is Anne Kittian's work with school children in rural France, as well as her most more recent work on the club at Le Bourg in saint Um If you don't know that the club, you know, part of institutional psychotherapy is you have to have a club. Um, and this is a patient-run collective um, within the institution. So Anne's work suggests that within the, an establishment, there's multiple nested institutions. So you, you have all these kind of different institutions that are kind of nested within each other. Um, each connects to a form of power impacting the other institutions and working together as a machine to produce different forms of subject subjectification. The school, for example, has institutions created in the different classrooms, the cafeteria, the playground, and so on which are also networked to other institutions outside of the school, such as the family, the church, the military. The social, therefore, is created um, in the ways in which this kind of complex refrain, to use the modification that Guattari coined in Chaosmosis, um, cuts through these different institutional arrangements, temporalizing as well as spatializing um, society. For Guattari, this complex refrain is a containing mechanism. Um, in, in fact, if you go back to Thousand Plateaus, Guattari with Deleuze defines the refrain as a rhythmic pattern that creates territories ter and territorial assemblages. When presented with the chaos of the world, the refrain offers a structure and a comfort to the subject. In other words, it contains the subject. Um, as Berardi, as Bifo Berardi reminds us, the refrain is, quote, um, an obsessional ritual that's initiated in linguistic, sexual, social, productive, existential behavior to allow the individual, the conscious organism, in the continuous variation, to find identification points. That is, to territorialize oneself and to represent oneself in relation to the world that surrounds it. End quote. So the rhythmic nature of the refrain allows the subject to understand durations of time through the kind of way in which it temporalizes. And, and through this, it spatializes the subject so that the subject can have relation to the space it's within. Um, and, and you get this exactly from Anne's work in schools to think about how these refrains cut through the different institutional arrangements. So the student understands duration of time as well as the relation vis-a-vis -vis the school building. Um, 
Within an ethical aesthetic paradigm, which Guattari and other places referred to as a form of institutional creativity, partial objects assemble together to form a complex refrain where the different components retain their heterogeneity but are nonetheless captured by a refrain that has installed itself as an attractor. This refrain couples the partial objects to an existential territory of myself. So for example, the neurotic, the refrain develops into a hardened representation, whereas the psychotic, the partial objects move off in delirious lines. The paradox of the complex refrain is that through the ethical aesthetic, that is through these different creative practices, um, it opens up onto a constellation of universes. And this is because the partial objects are linguistic or semiotic fragments, and the ethical aesthetic can intervene to rearrange them in a liberating collective enunciation of desire. Um, so this is exactly what Guattari is thinking about when he talks about institutional creativity. And again, going back to Anne Killian's work on the club, I think it becomes really insightful. So she talks about the role of a club um, in institutional psychotherapy as forming, in a kind of almost Trotskyite way, a double power. Um, so you have an institutional arrangement, <clears throat> you know, that, that is the board clinic, and then within that you have the patient club. So the patient club is self-generating. Um, they work to produce whatever they want. Um, often they, they'll put out newspapers, um, patient clubs will, they, they ran a bar at the board um, where, where you can kind of buy, you know, dip sodas and soft drinks, uh, not, not hard drinks, um, and cigarettes and things like that. Um, they would organize plays and film projects. Um, in fact, kind of media and film projects were really important to the day-to-day -day, um, therapeutic practices at the board clinic. But all of this came from the, the club, but it didn't come, you know, the club wasn't subtracted from the board clinic, you know, uh, while he was alive, jean Uri would meet with the club um, every week. Um, and, and then the club then would initiate um, a form of creativity that would then mutate the containing institution. So what we get here, what, what Anne discusses, is the way in which this kind of nesting of different institutional arrangements mutate each other and become co-constructive. Um, so therefore, you need something, a, a different machine, to help mutate it. Um, in the board clinic, this machine was referred to as the grid. Um, and Guattari, while he was alive, was referred to as the grid master by everyone there. Um, which apparently he was never quite happy with. <laughs> the, the grid was a way of organizing the daily activities of the hospital, um, where it was basically a work schedule, right? So, so every week someone has to clean the toilets. Every week someone has to do the gardening. Um, and everyone who works at the board clinic had to submit themselves to the grid, which meant psychiatrists had to scrub toilets, um, patients, had to welcome new residents in, you know, or pick up people from the train station. Um, of course, they kept their specialized roles as well, so patients wouldn't run individual therapy. Um, you know, that, that was, you know, Polak, Uri, Guattari, and others, right? Um, but it was a way of forcing um, them to, to move throughout the institution. And what's really significant about this is it caused a lot of conflict and that was the point. You know, the point was to cause friction and cause conflict. And then through the negotiations is how kind of different forms of sociality became mutated. You know, so, so um, you know, it's transversal in, in the proper sense, right? Because it cuts across all roles within the institution. So this becomes a motor that moves these different kind of nested institutions around. And then they kind of keep in a kind of almost like autopoeic process, kind of co-constructing and changing each other. Um, I would be really remiss if I didn't also include the thought of Franz Fanon here. Um, a lot of this is because Fanon, up until fairly recently, 
was always subtracted from the history of, of psychotherapy. You know, he was always kind of phenomenal, the, the decolonial militant, right? And his psychotherapeutic work was often seen as an afterthought or, or in addition to. Um, since the publication of Alienation and Freedom, um, there is a renewed and, and quite late um, engagement with his therapeutic practice, but again, a lot of the commentators still try to remove him from institutional psychotherapy, which is absolutely mad, because if you actually read his therapeutic text, he never moved away from kind of institutional analysis as a practice. Um, and that's something that I think is really important because he took institutional analysis and explicitly applied it to his politics. Um, a, a really good example of this we get in the chapter, The Pitfalls of National Consciousness from the Wretched of the Earth. So foreshadowing what today is referred to as racial capitalism, Fanon in this chapter analyzes the coloniality of a nation's economy and how this perpetuates neocolonial managing structures of race and racial antagonisms. This can only be subverted, Fanon argues, by the rapid transition from a national consciousness framed by Western colonial thought to a decolonized political and social consciousness. To achieve this, Fanon looks to spatial practices, arguing that there must be, quote, decentralization in the extreme. Through the relocation and distribution of different institutions, to established rural areas outside of capital cities. By doing this, Fanon argued that the post-colonial African state will create transversal power dynamics that will ensure governance and administration power is decentralized and distributed throughout the population. You know, in fact, throughout this chapter, Fanon is explicitly translating the clinical techniques of institutional psychotherapy and institutional analysis into a schema for post-colonial development in order to formulate a psychosocially informed approach to decolonizing social and governmental institutions. Through the creation of new institutions in the post-colonial state, Fanon theorized that there would be an increase in the coefficient of transversality, creating a generalized ambiance of openness that can heal the state in the same way as the practices of institutional psychotherapy heal the hospital. Um, one of the things I think becomes really interesting is there's this kind of little antidote in this chapter where, where Fanon looks to the process of building a bridge. Um, and, and I don't mean that metaphorically, I mean that quite literally. You know, the FLN militants had to build a bridge. Um, and no one there worked, as, you know, they, they weren't workers, they, weren't, they didn't work in construction, they weren't surveyors. So they had to re-skill and learn how to do this and cause all these conflicts. And what Fanon talks about is in the process of building this bridge, they all were forced to kind of depersonalize in some way and, and kind of analyze the forms of subjectification. And it gave rise to um, a different unity of purpose, you know, and a different idea of the self. Um, it's a really small antidote that, you know, you can kind of miss if you blink, but, but I think it's really significant because he's exactly talking about, you know, how the kind of, by increasing the coefficient of transversality, you have an immediate impact on the formation of subjectivity through kind of institutional arrangements. So, as a way of concluding, I, I, I want to think about contemporary um, applications of institutional analysis. Because one of the problems here is that there's a tendency to kind of historicize all this stuff, you know what I mean? Um, you know, one, one thing you hear a lot at conferences is, yeah, wasn't the board great? If only, you know, if only that, that could exist today. Um, forgetting that, that the board still runs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, as if it just disappeared when, when you know, jean Louis died in 2007 or whatever, right? Um, so... I don't want to just kind of think of this as a dead practice. It's very much alive and very much still in practice. Um, some of the ways you get this, so there's uh, the network of institutional analysis. The network of institutional analysis is this kind of loose collective of people who work in mental health, um, academics, philosophers, 
um, as well as pedagogues and artists and curators. And the idea is within the network, uh, we meet and have these kind of colloquiums, well, ideally every year, but yeah. <laughs> life, um, where we discuss how, how you know, we're doing this and we, we kind of have these manic meetings where, where we think about how this can be applied um, in different practices. And what that gave rise to is the newly formed um, Center for Institutional Analysis. The Center for Institutional Analysis is based both within but outside of um, Goldsmiths College, where I work. And what it is, it's a way of bringing together contemporary practice. Um, research practice as well as organizational consultancy, uh, my work as a group um, facilitator, um, and so forth. And one of the, the first kind, kind of big research project that we're doing is something we're referring to as refugee cartographies. Uh, refugee cartographies is specifically looking at the refugees who came to London from the Rio Plata countries. That's Argentina, uh, Uruguay, and Chile. Um, you know, they, they arrived in the 1980s, a little bit in the 90s, um, running from the dictatorships in, in Latin America. And their history has largely been kind of forgotten. It wasn't well documented, especially not in English. Um, and, you know, to be blunt, a lot of the refugees are getting older now and they're starting to pass away. So, so we had this idea um, to do this research. And one of the things that's producing is really interesting. So the research is led by um, a woman, Stella Smith, who came from Uruguay, from Montevideo, um, as a refugee. Um, and through analyzing the kind of networks that the militants formed when they settled in London, one of the things that we're seeing is how London itself mutated in the 1980s because of the inclusion of these refugees, right? Which in some ways makes a lot of sense. If you take a bunch of anarchists and communists, pick them up and put them down somewhere else, it's going to change the, the political scene, right? But you, you had this kind of explosion under Thatcher of, of a very radical left critique and, and um, a kind of militant um, political organizing. And people often think about that in relation to the miners' strike, which of course is important and not to be ignored, but the techniques were explicitly migrated from Latin America to, um, to London and to the UK. The other thing that's really interesting is the institutions that the refugees formed. So every Sunday there would be a massive football game. You know, no matter who you were, if you were, you know, kind of Latino, Latina, um, and you came from one of the Rio de la Plata countries, you were going to be at that football game on Sunday. The football game created a space for conviviality and ultimately led to the production of a monthly newspaper. The newspaper was then how they narrated their experiences and then fed that back to, smuggled it to militants back in Latin America. So you immediately have these new forms of communication. And what we're hoping to kind of learn here um, is by understanding the way in which the militants created new institutions when they arrived, as do every refugee creates new institutions when they arrive in a state. You know, how can we make interventions and how can this then inform approaches to contemporary refugee crises? Um, you know, if one thing the 21st century seems to be marked by, it's an ongoing crisis of movement and displacement. You know, before Ukraine it was Syria. Um, before Syria is Eritrea, right? And we know with the coming climate um, catastrophe, um, refugees are just going to increase exponentially. So part of what we're trying to capture here is thinking about the institutions that were formed that were healing um, for the refugees as they came, and then how this can then inform, you know, in, in fact, create new refugee services today. All right, thanks.
no idea how long I talked for. I have no idea if I went over or not. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Thank you very much for your great talk. Uh, do you have any questions, or remarks, or objections? <laughs> I, I have, I have uh, two things. One, what you just said about the sort of way that um, this refugee community sort of uh, changed the landscape and then they, you know, formed this. I, I, I actually did some work on the uh, Filipina diaspora, uh -huh. and it's sim they have a, they had um, sort of a magazine that they formed where, so uh -huh. it, where not only was it not. Uh, sort of a magazine that was sort of written by a um, set of editors or anything, but it was, you know, stories from this diaspora of Filipino women in particular that were all over the world. So there's a, uh -huh. huge, percent, there's a huge part of the economy, so I was really fascinated about that. But I just wondered if you'd heard of that, because I think there, there's an interesting kind of, with your work with refugees and I think with this sort of migrant just diaspora of these, uh -huh. that, that's an interesting, just, Parallel, um, but my question then I was thinking about to Michaela's talk and um, what you said about you know in order to change uh, you have to to change the the organization and I wonder if this um, you know this form of analysis that, that you're talking about is something that you could actually apply to or that would be something that you could see as being a kind of solution or a way of addressing. Uh, social media and the, inter the the issues that she was referring to. Um, so, so to address your your first point, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I totally heard about that Filipina um, Is that publication. Is that like Teen Filipina or something like? Yeah, that? yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and I I could be wrong, but I believe um, the Philippines have the highest kind kind of per capita um, diaspora. They do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, especially in terms of um, sort of the it's a female diaspora. Yeah, exactly, and often um, domestic laborers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, which there, there's such a wealth of under researched um, knowledge about labor, you know, and about the kind of the, you know labor as specifically in the intersection of gender um, that that needs to be researched, and I think that newspaper is a, exactly the place to start making um, interventions and, and understanding that, you know, the kind of things that underpin modern capitalist mm -hmm. um, extraction. Um, in, in terms of social media, so the book I'm writing now started off a, as what was going to be a fairly neat and quick, tidy process that, that's grown into an absolute monster, um, looking at 2016. You, you know, because 2016, uh, the elections of Trump, uh, Brexit, and specifically the role of Cambridge Analytica um, and Facebook. Um, and one of the things that I've, in, in, in using uh, Wilhelm Reich, because, you know, <laughs> you know. Um, and one of the things that I found is that that's an impossible book to write, if you want to do it correctly. And in fact, to understand 2016, you need to start in 1956. Um, 1956 is the year of Brown v. Board of Education. And as a response to Brown v. Board of Education, a group of Southern economists created what today is known as the Libertarian Movement, um, specifically uh, this guy Buchanan. Um, they, they kind of plowed along for several years thinking about the issue of states' rights and how we can, you know, form a kind of what today we would think of kind of a cultural politics, right, or the culture wars. Um, and then they gained kind of potency in the 1960s when they married their movement to evangelical Protestantism. Um, and then this kind of mutated an idea of Christianity as tied to whiteness um, and, and kind of deregulated capital, right? So... What's really interesting is if you look at Silicon Valley, you know, you look at people like, you know, Peter Thiel, um, that they, you know, they, they often claim to be kind of Randian libertarians. Um, and, and that's not entirely incorrect, but, but they're, they're part of an ideological movement um, that, that is implicitly funded, you know, founded on racial exclusion. Um, 
so I find it difficult to disentangle the way in which they have constructed a kind of infrastructure undergirding digital media without thinking about these kind of implicit ideological references in the history that they carry. Um, a, a really good example of this is the recursive feedback loops uh, within um, social media. So, so in social media, um, it, it's a real quite elegant way of, of creating the attention economy. So based on, you know, they have an AI kind of scanning your search, um, you know, the, the cookies you have on your, on your browser. And then they determine what would be content that you would be interested in. And then they amplify that. So they, they, they create a positive feedback loop where they amplify a specific piece of content. Um, and then you can only hold an amplification for so long before it becomes unstable. Um, so then they modulate to a negative feedback loop that moves you into a direction. So if you want to know, say, how radicalization happens online, it's exactly through this process where you start off as a kind of alt-light, you know, I'm racist curious <laughs> kind of posts and searches um, on YouTube, and you end up with frothing at the mouth white supremacy, right, um, pretty quickly. And this has an immediate impact, as we know from Guattari, on subjectification. You know, Guattari talks about um, the television and the kind of post-media as creating subjectivity because what happens is, is it takes a part of your subjective position, of your unconscious, and it amplifies it so that it overcodes the rest of your mind. And then it moves you on to a way that strengthens that. So it keeps creating partial objects that overcode the, the totality. Um, so in terms of how do you analyze social media to make an intervention into it, um, short answer, I don't know. Half the time, I just want to say burn it all down. Um, but, but, but I do think understanding the kind of infrastructure that undergirds social media is a really crucial point to begin with, which again is the collective, it's the collective equipment. Yeah. So would you say then that because of the way the algorithms, which are, I mean, there's, there's the idea of increasing sort of a coefficient of transversality is really difficult because where would one intervene and like a short of hacking and like somehow being able to scramble those codes and, and yeah, do yeah, it yeah. that way. I mean, I mean there, there's interesting stuff around kind of mesh networks mm -hmm. that, that you can do, but, but the problem with mesh networks is that they're always localized, you know, you, you can't have a kind of global mesh network. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they're, they're, and they, they kind of had a moment during the Occupy movements, you know, where, where they set up mesh networks in Zuccotti Park. Um, there's a thing with bike punks, and, you know, kind of bike couriers in, in London, where, where a lot of them on, and their message, um, messenger bags have little kind of routers. So, so they've set up a mesh network around London for, for bike couriers. Um, and through that mesh network, a lot of the Deliveroo writers um, actually use that to help organize and collectivize and demand um, to be basically demand union rights um, and led to a strike of Deliveroo workers a few years ago. Um, so I, I do see interventions like that at, at a kind of micro level as being really potent, but at the kind of larger kind of planetary computer level, I mean, fuck if I know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh -huh. Last question. Um, I have a rather practical question than a theoretical one. So you said that um, so half of the patients in the hospital in 1939 was uh, um, mainly due to the incorporation of the hospital into the surrounding village. But um, how was this done? Because I imagine this hospital to be a highly functional machine of um, anti hierarchic mechanisms and uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, um, into sociabilities, uh, which is then incorporated into a village, which I can only imagine in France in 1939, which was highly hierarchic, um, conservative, and probably the, the complete um, opposite to the constitution uh, to the institution of the hospital. So, how was this practically done? So, th that that's a really good question. Um, so, Saint Alban was a very traditional, uh, that is say, kind of um, disciplinary psychiatric institution. And then in 1938, I believe, 37, 38, Paul Blavet became the director there. Um, and, and he had a quite radical critique 
Um, and he was bringing in doctors to kind of do it, and he was trying to make overtures to the village for, for a few years. Um, at this time in Spain, Francois Tosquez, uh, he was the chief psychiatric officer in the Marxist party for unification fighting the fascists. Um, after the Stalinists betrayed the anarcho-syndicalists and fascism won, um, Tosquez found himself in a refugee camp um, in France. Um, as soon as he got to the refugee camp, he established a therapeutic community in the refugee camp. Um, in, in an interview before he died, he said that that's the place where he thinks he did the best work of his life, which was in the refugee camp. Um, he made a bit of a name for himself. He became known as the Red Psychiatrist. Um, he famously only had two books with him. One was Lacan's PhD thesis on psychosis, and the other was um, Herman Simon's book on institutions. Uh, Paul Blavet heard about this and kind of plucked him out of the camp and moved him to Saint Alban. And then, you know, it was from 1939 until the Nazi invasion of the Vichy regime, it was a process of first quite literally tearing down walls. Um, and then making overtures to the village. And then the, when the confinement happened, it created a crisis, right? Um, and, and I think this notion of crisis is something really important because crisis shares the root word with critique. You know, and crisis in this case is seen as something like a chance to form a new relationship because of the breakdown. Um, so, so they kind of took advantage of that moment and they're like, if we're going to survive this, if we only survive it this way, and, and given the breakdown of social order with the occupation, the villagers were receptive. Thank you. I just a short comment. Uh, I, I really enjoyed your description of deinstitutionalization of social practices in psychiatry. Mm -hmm. uh, I must confess, uh, I made a different experience during my internship in psychiatry clinic here in Prague, mm. and uh, but uh, it, it was uh, actually something that uh, you reminded me of when you were talking about um, uh, the kitchen uh, uh, arrangement, and um, this was uh, related to dining room uh, in the psychiatric clinic uh, where the, uh, there was no uh, dining. Uh, Order and patients were allowed to sit with, whom, with whomever, uh, whomever they wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the psychiatrist observed them and uh, they told me proudly, they boasted, uh, that uh, they figured out uh, that uh, it's actually quite helpful uh, when they observe patients, how they eat, with whom they eat, because they, they realized that. Uh, Patients with the same or similar diagnosis get together. So mm. Depressives sit around the one table. Uh, the toxicomans sit around the other mm -hmm. table. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, the psychiatrist told me that uh, it helped them when they were not sure in a singular case whether the pa patient is borderline or <laughs> neurodepressive or whatever. Uh, it helped them to put the, the label on, oh, on fuck the patient. Me. So uh, it, it, it's, I, I just wonder, uh, how would you analyze this uh, in terms of institutional analysis? Because it seems to me that uh, basically you allow patients to interact freely, but at the same time uh, you use it for the control purposes. Mm -hmm. So what they did at the board in San Alban, what they do at the board and what they did at San Alban, um, was to create the conditions within which that would not happen. Um, and they did that by kind of instituting social programs that would force them to kind of step outside their comfort zone. Um, and they found that, you know, this, this makes it sound way easier than it was. You know, it was a really, really messy and um, difficult process to do. But um, they, by getting depressives to work in the garden, with somebody with a kind of psychotic diagnosis, you know, by, by getting people with different diag you know, diagnoses, which they were a bit suspicious of anyways, to work together in different tasks, um, they created different forms of sociality. So, so they immediately worked to interrupt that grouping um, in, in order to create different ways in which 
sociality and communication can, can happen. Um, so th they, they were very aware of that kind of natural, natural grouping that, that you get in psychiatric services, and, and they actively worked to destabilize it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and important. Yeah, 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 super important. Yeah.